for those of you guys who need PDHs, please keep in mind that we will be answer, posting up quiz questions throughout the presentation today, and you need to answer those questions correctly in order to get your PDH hours. For you guys that don't need the PDHs, you're more than welcome to just go ahead and answer for fun. Uh, we're also going to record this webinar for future usage, just so you're aware. Um, let me back up there. It all starts with good design. Uh, my name is Dave Taylor with TEC. We've got Doug Carell from, I'm sorry, Doug Waylou from Corral with us. Uh, we've seen many faux pas out in the field, field faux pas if you want to call them. But we just kind of want to get you a good start on what to design, what are things critical in design, and then what to uh, look for in the field as to uh, maybe some malfunctions of systems. Uh, we are going to be using Corel's program, uh, humidifynow.com, and I just wanted to show you down at the bottom, you can create your own engineering account if you want to, and um, you can log in, you can uh, design systems, uh, <clears throat> and then if you need something like budget price, uh, our TEC rep will be assigned your account and he can give you some budget pricing. So if you choose to, you can go to humidifynow.com and uh, create an engineering account and uh, that will be sent to Doug and we will assign the correct TEC TM to your account to help you out. All right, in all estimating programs, the input is critical. And you can see here there's some things about configuration, uh, what type of humidifiers you're, design, uh, you're selecting, type of design, uh, duct height and width, airflow, uh, outside air, uh, dry bulb, uh, inside conditions. Uh, it all goes into calculating the humidity load. We're going to start with the first one here, and that one is duct distribution. There's two types of duct distribution to get steam into the space. One is through the ductwork, and one is having something just in the room. You, you're dumping steam or mist into the room. Also, the humidi humidification process. There's two types. You have isothermal, and you have adiabatic. We're going to talk about each of those if you're not familiar with the uh, process of getting uh, moisture into the space. So we're going to talk about each one of those right here. So we're going to start with isothermal. Isothermal is basically putting uh, steam into the airspace, and we can do it with either a pressurized boiler system or with a standalone humidifier, steam humidifier. The standalone systems come in either uh, electrode in the electric side, electric element on the electric side, or a gas-fired humidifier. So starting on the top with the electrode, the electrode basically uses a disposable canister with an electrode inside the canister. Upon the call for humidity, what happens is the electrode sends an electronic charge through the water, utilizing the minerals in the water to cause an electronic action, reaction that we call the Joule effect, which causes the water to heat up and boil. Through this process, since we need the minerals in the water, the best type of water for this humidifier is generally potable water, because if we start to use reverse osmosis or DI water with this process, it removes the minerals from the water that are needed for the humidifier to perform. Uh, next, it also doesn't like softened water either because softened water tends to uh, build up on the electrode and shorten the life of the electrode. It also um, causes the unit to foam, which is detrimental to the uh, humidification process as well. Next one down, we have 
the uh, uh, element, resistive element style humidifier. Basically how this system works, it uses a permanent element immersed into, or a permanent tank with a, uh, an element, resistive element immersed inside upon the call for humidity. The element itself heats up very similar to that of an electric water heater. Um, since we no longer need the minerals in the water for the unit to perform, we can now use reverse osmosis or DI water with this uh, type of humidification. Uh, we still don't like to use softened water if we, if we don't have to because it'll still cause foaming, foaming inside the tank. The next type of humidification down is the gas-fired humidifier. Um, generally speaking, the gas units uh, will handle a much larger load capacity than you can get with standalone electrodes. You can go in uh, standalone units anywhere from 100, 200, 400, and up to 600 pounds an hour. And then from there, we go to a direct steam manifold, which will generally tap into a building's existing boiler system. And this can also be utilized as a short absorption manifold for the standalone humidifiers. From there, we go to our adiabatic uh, humidification systems. Adiabatic tends to use a uh, misting process rather than steam to humidify the space. So generally, you would use, either use um, ultrasonic technology uh, to create the mist or a water and air pressure or a high pressure fogging system like you see on top with the humifog. So starting on the top with the humifog system, uh, this particular type of system uses a high pressure pump that builds water up into a very tight stainless steel water line uh, at 1,000 PSI. It uh, basically uses a variable frequency drive motor, so it builds the pressure up inside uh, the motor, maintains 1,000 PSI, and then backs off until there's a call for humidity. This unit also has multi-zone capabilities, so can generally uh, feed up to, depending on the size of the, of, the, of the load, up to 12 systems with one single pumping station. Next system down, we have what we call an MC, uh, which is an air and water humidifier. This utilizes a building's existing air compressor at 100 PSI, or you can size an air compressor to match the system. What happens is the cabinet controls um, the distribution of both the air and water uh, to the manifold nozzle, and then it sprays directly either into the air handler or into uh, the space. And then, of course, uh, last but not least, we have ultrasonic. Ultrasonic uses piezoelectric transducers at the uh, underside of the water tank. Upon the call for humidity, the uh, piezoelectric transducers vibrate breaking the water down to a very fine mist, and then, of course, humidifying the, the space that way. Okay. Thank you, Doug. All manufacturers are going to have something similar. Each manufacturer has their own variations of it, but it's needed to understand some of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, with selection and design in the field. So that was a brief review. If you want to know anything more about Corel, you could talk to your TEC representative. Um, Back to the program. Some of the critical things are duct. Oh, sorry, Brian. Quiz. Uh, here we go. So the first quiz question. What do isothermal? All right. All right. First quiz first question. question. What do isothermal, do isothermal systems, systems create? create? Your choices are A, A mist, B, steam, steam, C, evaporative steam, cooling, D, D pressure. pressure. You should be able to go ahead and answer that question online now. We'll leave it up there for about a minute or so. In the meantime, we'll look and see if there's any questions that you've asked for our presenters, and we can quiz them. So John asks, what protection for potable water is provided at the water fill connection to the unit? An air gap, an RPV, et cetera. Can you repeat the question, please? All right, so the question is, what protection for potable water, so this is your connection to the city water supply, do you have at the water fill connection to the unit? He's asking if you have to put an air gap in there, an RPZ. John, I think that's going to be dependent on your local codes. 
Uh, in a lot of cases, an RPC is not required, uh, but generally you're going to have to, at a minimum, have a double uh, check valve and an air gap associated with that for pretty much any community. But whether you need an RPC or not is probably going to be location dependent. Uh, let's pull another one up here. Oh, oh Ned, uh, Doug wants to add something to that. Yep, take me up you. Or am I? No, no, you're up. No, we're up mute. Okay, yeah. so uh, the other thing is, is, is if the concern is, is to help uh, remove sediment in the tank, you can put a number one and number five micron filter at the supply line before it goes into the humidifier, and that'll help alleviate uh, some of the sediment buildup. All right, and then one more question here. We'll ask one from Nick. Uh, are there particular delivery ranges where each of these types of humidification systems work best in terms of pounds per hour? Um, that's going to depend 100% on the, on the uh, basic load uh, size of the project itself. So we're going to cover that in a little bit more detail further down, but generally it's determined by the, uh, the CFM of, of the air handler and then the percentage of outside air combined with the uh, design requirements of the project. I can't say, Ryan, that probably 80% of the ones we quote are the electrode models under 300 pounds per hour. All right, very you know, good. Once, once you get to the adiabatic systems, uh, those more are hospital applications, built up custom systems, things like that. All right, so 91% of the people have answered the quiz question, so I'm going to close it in five, four, three, two, one, and I'll put the uh, answers up on the screen here. So 78% of the folks answered as STEAM. Correct. All right, back to you, Dave. Okay, moving right along here. Um, duct height and width, that's critical. This is something you really shouldn't be guessing at. Uh, first of all, because uh, we size the distribution tube that goes in there. Uh, and secondly, that determines the velocity of the air passing over the, uh, the distribution tube, which determines the uh, absorption distance. So this is something, if you're going to do a, an electrode system, which is what we see most of the time, this is something that you should not guess at. You should get the exact dimensions of the duct. Uh, the other thing is airflow. You know, that we usually get. Uh, that you can get from an air handler or a rooftop unit or a, a VAB box or whatever. But the outside air question is something that is, is critical. Um, what determines humidity needs is air coming in at minus 10 or 0 uh, and maybe 30% relative humidity and then heating it up to 70 degrees. Uh, sometimes it will ask you the question about what is the uh, entering air temperature of the distributor. Usually you get that question on um, pressurized systems, but that will determine uh, the absorption distance. This is a little chart here. This shows you why the outside air is important. You can see uh, along the horizontal axis, the, if the outdoor air temperature in this example is plus 10, and um, the outdoor air uh, relative humidity is even 70%, which is pretty high, if you bring that air in and you mix it and you bring it in and heat it up to 70 degrees for the inside temperature, it's going to be at 6% relative humidity. So. A lot of times when we get asked about, you know, can you size this system, you know, people don't know what the amount of outside air is. And, and this is a critical amount that you do, whether it's through infiltration that you have uh, through the building or uh, through fireplaces. Um, you know, one time we had a job that had a lot of infiltration to the fireplaces. It was a high-end residence. They had a lot of wood furniture, wood floors, and they couldn't understand why they weren't controlling the humidity. Well, they forgot to bring it, they forgot to account for all the outside air coming in through the fireplace dampers. So knowing the amount of outside air is, is very, very critical. Um, also, if you do the room distribution, uh, it will ask you a room height and room air changes. And it will either figure out uh, from the airflow or the air changes per hour what the humidification load is. All right. Now I'm going to go a little bit, I'm going to go back to the Humidify Now program here. From those things you can calculate heat loss. So now once you have your humidification load, in this example we had duct sizes 32 by 26 and airflow 2000 CFM and 100% outside air. 
if I went to 50% outside air, it would be less, of course. And I said the outside air dry bulb was 10, and outside air humidity is 10%. Uh, when you get down to that low, all the grains of moisture are pretty similar. So whether you say 10, 20, 30, it really doesn't matter at that point. And here, the air entering the distributor, that's going to determine the absorption distance, which in some cases is very critical if you have line duct or if you have an elbow following the, uh, the steam distributor. Uh, that's very critical. So uh, Doug's going to go into a little bit about the humidifier. You can see there's different types, steam or pressurized, like we just talked about. In this one, we pick steam humidifier, and these are the three type of Corel units that have steam, that produce steam. And don't forget, this is atmospheric steam. This isn't pressurized steam. This is just atmospheric. So, Doug, I just wanted to show people what the difference was once you talk about the voltage in the face a little bit, why that's Absolutely. Important. So one of the things that uh, often gets uh, overlooked when you're putting the project together is to make, to make sure at the project site what the actual voltage and phase is of, of the building requirements so that we select the right uh, voltage and phase for the humidifier when it's being manufactured. Uh, a lot of times an order will come in and we'll get a call after the fact saying that the wrong voltage was selected. Uh, this can become quite costly when you're out in the field and uh, you start uh, to install and you find out that you don't have the right voltage at the job location. So what you need to do is double check that voltage. We uh, recently had a project that we worked on where we had up to about 11 humidifiers at the job site and the application called for uh, 230 volt and at the job site they only gave us 208. So the project had to be rewired at the factory which uh, became to be quite costly. Mm -hmm. So you need to watch what you're doing at the, at the job site level when you order as well, not just on the sizing side of it. Yeah, you can see this is the electrode model, and you can see for the different voltages and different sizes, it does change. The higher the voltage, the more pounds per hour. And you can see on this one at 460, you know, there's several choices you can take, but a lot, a lot of times we're asked to size or replace a humidifier, and they gave us they give us a uh, a nameplate rating, and designs change over time. So um, you you'd size it on what the nameplate rating is, it may be a little different. The amp draw may be a little different. We just had a situation like that where uh, the older unit was a little bit more robust, a little bit uh, sturdier, and the newer unit um, was a, a little bit more fine-tuned, I should say, and the amp draw was a little higher. So one of the things, if you're replacing a unit, make sure what kind of amp draw you have, what kind of circuit do you have you know, breaker, fuse, whatever you have feeding the system, and that will help you uh, design a new system. Um, Going to go back, back here. We also ask about the cylinder type. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The cylinder type, most of the time you can select a standard cylinder. Uh, most manufacturers have low conductivity cylinders. Um, you might want that low conductivity cylinder in, um, well, for example, uh, New York. Uh, yeah, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to show you something a little bit later on here. Next slide. Uh, spare cylinders. Uh, I always price in spare cylinders because a lot of times a spare set of filters, you know, they use the air handler and the filters during construction. Uh, they may do that for, you know, they may use the humidifier for construction and uh, you may want an extra set of cylinders. But I want to talk a little bit about the water quality, and this kind of gets into the cylinders, whether it's standard or low conductivity. For electrode-type humidifiers, the first one that Doug said that we see most often, you need minerals to conduct the electricity. And you can see it talks about microsomes. That's what that is right there, right? Uh, and you can see that the electrode is between 300 and 1200. Well, for example, in New York City, the city water has micro siemens of 60 siemens, uh, I mean particulates per cubic uh, meter. So you'd want a low conductivity cylinder in that case, uh, whereas right across the river in New Jersey has 800, which is more in the range. So it's, if you're going to use the electrotype, it's really 
important to know what the specific conductivity is uh, of the water that you're using. Because some places, there's some manufacturing facilities, they do use uh, reverse osmosis water. And the reverse osmosis or very pure systems would not work well with this electrode type humidifier. Now, it would work well with other type humidifiers, which we talk about in a second. Generally, you can get the information, this is Doug talking, um, from your local municipality as far as what the water quality is. So you basically just call them up or email them and ask them for the latest uh, water, water treatment uh, test. And they'll uh, send you out what it is. And you can generally find out where your water sits as far as the uh, total uh, dissolved solids. If you do get to the situation where you get one of these electrodes out in the field and you have very pure water, you have to do a little bit of mixing with the mixing valve uh, to get the, uh, the uh, micro siemens up to the minimum limits because the units will not operate. They will not control correctly and you won't get the rated steam, if any steam at all. Uh, I always get a question, uh, hey, I've got water softener, uh, softened water. Uh, can I use a softened water for this uh, system? This happened recently with a large uh, residential high-end condominium. Uh, and the answer is no, uh, as Doug stated before, he said because it could cause foaming and affect the operation, it would decrease the capacity. The softened water, uh, you get a lot of foam generated in the canisters, so you would not want to do that, uh, any kind of water, softened soften water at all. Uh, and it also said do not add disinfectants or anti-corrosive compounds uh, because they are irritants. And all this stuff I'm taking is right from the installation manual, but a lot of times, as we know, that Sometimes that's, you know, not red. Uh, all right, Doug, you want to cover the electro resistance type? Absolutely. So uh, the water quality requirements for the resistive type humidifier are um, not as challenging as they are for the electrode style uh, because uh, we're not requiring the minerals in the water for the unit to perform. However, the amount of... Uh, dissolved solids that are in the electric resistive type humidifier are going to affect the maintenance on it. So David has circled on there 20 as being the minimum. So if, if you're on the lower side, this generally means that you can use the potable water uh, without having to treat it and have a fairly decent maintenance cycle. You're still going to want to take the, thing, the uh, humidifier apart every six months to disassemble it, uh, remove any sediment that's built up, and of course, put it back together and, and uh, put it back into production. If you're on the higher side of upwards to, to 1,500 micro siemens, uh, you're going to want to treat that water with either uh, RO or DI water. And the, the purpose for this is, is you want to remove those minerals to uh, extend the life of the humidifier and re reduce the amount of maintenance that the unit requires. Yeah, Doug and I were out at a cancer clinic a couple of years ago, and they were complaining about uh, uh, cleaning their humidifier. And it was an electric resistance type of humidifier, and they were cleaning it every three months, Doug? Yes, something like that. Yeah, and well, we said, you know, this is why you don't have a reverse osmosis system. So we gave them some alternatives for what they could do, but it, it will operate, but its maintenance is, is a, a headache. Uh, some manufacturers have systems that you can... Uh, shock the uh, electric resistance element and it breaks off the sediment and you can extend the cleaning cycle and the capacity but it will gunk up pretty quickly and you will reduce capacity. Correct and if I remember right, that particular job they wanted us to recommend a humidifier that would work best for the water they had. Um, we found that extremely hard to do when really all they needed was a reverse osmosis or a DI system to, to clean up the water. The humidifier they had would work just fine with the reverse osmosis water. And this is what a reverse osmosis or DI, as Doug calls it, uh, deionized water. This is what it looks like. They're not that expensive. Um, you know, when we quote a system, uh, we always quote it. If it's not called out for in the plans or specifications, we always recommend that a reverse osmosis system um, is provided uh, and we can do that for you but if you're planning if you're designing one of these systems and you are using an electric resistance type which uh, electric resistance type is more accurate as far as maintaining certain humidity conditions in the space uh, the electrode type is good for 
commercial office buildings, things like that. But you know, for medical facility, if you want to maintain it within plus or minus 1%, then you want the electric resistance type or even the gas type that has a high unloading. Okay, Ryan. All right, question number two. Question number two. True or false? I need a reverse osmosis system for an electrode humidifier. All right, while you guys are thinking that over and answering, uh, we'll read a couple of these questions for uh, Dave and Doug. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question, but I'm going to read it anyway, just in case they do. Uh, Dale asks, how many cases should you run the sizer for when you have DCV, an economizer, et cetera? Demand control. Yeah, demand control ventilation and economizer. Oh, because the, the demand control will change the amount. Demand control will change the amount of outside air. I, I believe that's what Dale was asking. Yeah, demand control will bring you below the code required air. I don't know why that would change your humidification. I, I guess if I understand the question, I would run it at the worst case. At the that's, worst. That's correct. At minus ten with the highest ventilation load. Yeah, just, just like with other stuff, we don't change the sizing of the cooling or heating plant because of DCV, because there's that one day you need the full capacity. It's going to be the same kind of answer here, I believe. Correct. All right, another question here. We'll read one more uh, coming from Greg. Do you often see a humidifier operation problems that result from an owner who has overridden or closed the outside air intake dampers? I often hear of maintenance and operational problems associated with dehumidifiers. Well, I, I think what he's asking is, 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 is a pretty common question. And um, yes, you could have problems, but most humidifiers uh, can reduce their load depending on what the humidistat calls for. So if somebody has, you know, closed off the outside air dampers, so you're not bringing in any of that cold, you know, dry air, it's not mixing, they becoming real dry, uh, most humidifiers, you know, go down to... You know, 25 percent for the gas humidifier, Doug, 12 and a half if it's one of the 400 pounds yep. per hour. Um, the electric resistance type goes down to 5 percent? Uh, no, actually zero. Zero percent? 100 percent modulating. Um, so basically, in most instances, you're going to have sensors in place that are going to catch the, uh, what the set point is set at. And, and regardless of the dampers being open or closed, once it reaches the uh, design set point is going to shut down. If it isn't, then you might need to check to see if the uh, sensors are need to be cleaned or uh, have debris or, or, or even uh, wired. But uh, outside of that, um, there are fail safes put in place so that you do not oversaturate the space. And then you might want to go check and see if the outside air dampers are screwed shut. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let's close our quiz question in three, two, one. And 83% of the folks said false, which is the correct answer. That's correct. All right, operating limits. Um, each humidifier has operating limits. Um, this is directly from the installation manual. The ambient conditions uh, for the Corel are anywhere from 33.8 to 104 degrees centigrade. So putting this on a roof uh, would be kind of dicey up here in Chicago. Florida would be okay. Um, Doug and I were out to a, a job site where they, or excuse me, a contractor had us in, and they put a unit uh, up on the roof, and it froze up. And they asked, you know, can we still use it? And uh, we said, well, no, because uh, not just the plastic things could crack, sensors could be damaged. There's a whole lot of things that could heat, go. Heat exchanger inside, uh, heat exchanger. Gets frozen, would crack and uh, not perform. Right, so there are operating conditions. Uh, most of the time, you know, these humidifiers are placed inside, but if they are placed outside, uh, we can provide you with a, a uh, uh, heated and cooled enclosure, like the seat, you see the one that uh, is pictured here. Um, the uh, middle picture is the climate control unit to keep it within the operating ranges. Uh, you can see the whole unit on the left. On the right, you can see where the condensate from the humidifier goes. This is a gas model. Um, so we can't provide you with this, but you cannot put this on the roof or any place where it's going to get outside those operating conditions. Unless it's uh, provided inside a vestibule or an enclosure. Correct. Now, let me jump back to the program here. 
one of the things that Doug covered the voltage, you see the voltage here, standard or low conductivity. Uh, the distribution product, you can use the ultimate steam manifold, which is very pure steam, gets absorbed very quickly, distribution tube, a jet distributor, uh, and also how long it is. Uh, Doug's going to talk a little bit about this, but he was really going to talk about the methods of distribution. Uh, the, well, the methods of distribution in a second. Uh, we're going to get into that a little bit more, but you see the method, the steam hose is 10 feet. So, so, so basically, the, um, when we go into our selection tool, it automatically uh, uh, falls into 10 feet of a rubber steam hose. The reason we do that is 10 feet is the optimum distance from the top of the humidifier to either the distributor tube or short absorption manifold. When you start going further than 10 feet, uh, what happens is this is atmospheric steam. So when you start going further than 10 feet, it starts to cool down. And what happens when humidity uh, or moisture cools down, it condensates. So you start losing steam to condensate. You can go further than 10 feet, but you need to basically compensate. So we recommend using a rubber steam hose going no further than 20 feet and at 10 feet between the humidifier and the distributor, we recommend putting a copper T in place along with a P-trap to drain off any condensate. From there, you want to make sure you're at a constant upward motion from the top of the humidifier to the distributor so you get nice, clean, even steam distribution. Now at 20 feet, we recommend adding 25% to your humidification load to compensate for the steam loss you will get. From there, you can go to 40 feet using 2-inch insulated copper. When you use 2-inch insulated copper, you need to make sure you use a minimum of bends in the line. So if you need to put an elbow, we recommend using a series of 45s. From there, uh, if you do use a 90, you need to know that adding a 90 is like adding 10 equivalent feet of hose. So you need to uh, reduce the amount of 90 degree elbows that you utilize. Now, at 40 feet, at the 20 foot mark, you need to remember to put the uh, copper tee in place with the uh, P-trap as well to drain off the condensate. We're going to get into this with some pictures a little bit later on, but that 10, 10 feet is really equivalent feet. So if we just take a distributor pipe, it's going to ask us different questions. If it was uh, a short absorption module, it would ask us where do we want the control valves and how do you want us to configure the the manifold itself. But most of the time we just get distributor pipe. But I'm going to go back to my slides and Doug's going to talk a little bit about how we can put steam into the space. So in the picture here, um, we have in the middle of the picture single distribution tubes. And basically what happens is, is uh, and when you are doing a standard duct or air handler distribution, you would utilize these single distribution tubes, which generally come from about 12 inches on up to 84 inches, and it's going to be determined on the width of the air handler or the duct or the load requirements, uh, because as you go into a longer distribution tube, the, the load capability of that distribution tube increases as well. Generally, this is going to be used in common applications where you have about 36 to 48 inches of absorption distance inside the air handler or duct. Uh, when you start need to go in shorter than that, then you would switch over to a short absorption manifold. From there, off to the left, you will see we have uh, what we call a jet stream distributor. This is going to be utilized in applications where you are at uh, duct widths of 12 inches or less. From there, you would go to the top where you would see a uh, blower pack. This, um, depending on manufacturer, can either be mounted directly on top of the humidifier and mounted to a wall, and this would be utilized in applications uh, where you need to go directly into the space and don't have access to a duct or an air handler for distribution. Uh, from there, if you have uh, uh, a little bit larger humidifier and you're not able to mount it to the top, 
most manufacturers will also have a remote mounted blower that you can mount off to the side and then you would utilize the rubber steam hose to go from the top of the humidifier to the blower pack. Yes, this is the steam hose right here. It's a flexible reinforced steam hose. This is the condensate hose. The steam hose would go right there. The condensate would go right underneath it. And sometimes you may have more than one distrib distributor tube in the ductwork, so you'd use a Y like this. This is the short absorption module, and this is you use this in uh, ductwork where you have uh, you need very short absorption distances. This is the manifold that they talk about, and this this is a single tube system. Correct. Now this would be utilized for high pressure systems where you're tapping into a building's existing. Uh, boiler system or for the uh, standalone electric and uh, gas units you would utilize it as a short absorption manifold as well. Uh, it comes in various different styles. The particular one that Corel has is uh, a stainless steel manifold with a uh, stainless steel insulated uh, manifold tube. A lot of the competitors use jacketed manifolds as well. Uh, some manufacturers recirculate the condensate back in through the steam trap and valve, and some uh, basically utilize a drain and, and drain the condensate off. And this is a, just a picture of what the remote blower would look like. Uh, you see the picture on the left with the, for the smaller units where the remote blower attaches directly to the uh, unit, and then on the one on the right where the uh, remote blower is a little larger, you have to mount it on the wall. And what are some of the problems? Out so the basically field? you have to pay close attention to how far it's mounted from the floor, uh, how far it's mounted uh, from the ceiling, and of course from any obstruction in front. So if you see uh, in the diagram it's showing example B, uh, you need to be, you know, uh, 72 inches away from any obstruction in front of it as well. Uh, and one of the things is Dave and I had went to a job site a few years ago where uh, the uh, humidification was designed after the uh, building w was put in, and so they had no choice but to go inside the space itself. Uh, once we were called to the job site to help them tweak the humidifiers, uh, we noticed that some of the installation that they did, they didn't pay attention to a lot of uh, what's the word? O obstacles, those obstacles types of things. Way, yeah. One of the humidifiers actually had a suspended fluorescent light uh, within three feet in front of the uh, humidifier, and of course, it was collecting moisture, and they wanted to know why. <laughs> I can hear people laughing in the background there. It, it may seem pretty obvious, but uh, a lot of times you got to uh, get to teach people to uh, to do things right. All right. So now you've got a good design. Now it has to be installed correctly. And this is where the installation manual comes into play. Now a lot of times when I go out and speak to engineers and contractors, I usually have an installation manual with me to kind of show them pictures from the installation manual. But you as an engineer or design build contractor can design it to the T to be correctly done, but then when it gets out to the field, it can change as we obviously see. So this is right from the installation manual. This is a do, okay? This is the do's, we do this. You can see that if you have a, a slight pitch, it's gotta be uh, greater than or equal to 20% because this is atmospheric steam. It's hot, it rises. If you have a, a downward slope to it, it has to be greater than or, five, uh, greater than or equal to 5%. Uh, you can see 10 feet max for the upward slope, 20 feet max for the Rubber tubing, the blue rubber tubing is max. Here's where it goes into the distribution tube, and if you have a little trap there, you have to trap it right there and right from the distribution tube because you don't want any place where the water can collect and the steam won't be able to get through to the to the uh, to, to the duct distributor to the ductwork. Uh, and like Doug said earlier, the length is an equivalent feet. Uh, a 90 degree elbow is 10 equivalent feet, 45s are, you know, 5 equivalent feet. Uh, copper tubing, if you use copper tubing, if you go over 20 equivalent feet, it's 2 inch insulated because it is atmospheric steam. And at 20 feet, you have to upsize the steam generator by at least 
or if it's at 40 feet, you've got to upsize it by 50%. So that's one of the most critical things that we see when you go out to job sites and they say that humidity isn't being controlled or there's condensation or whatever. Or you're not meeting your set point. Or you're not meeting your set point. Uh, here's another example. This is a little bit more detailed. Um, anytime you have a, a, a downslope like that, you have to put in a drain right there. You don't want some place where the condensate will collect and it'll block the steam. The other thing to remember too is when you're installing that distributor tube that it needs to be tilted backwards just a little bit right. so that the condensate can roll into the drain. Uh, we see this a lot if you had the steam generator up in the ceiling space and the ductwork down a little further, uh, you know, down at the bottom of the, right above the, uh, the tile, the ceiling tile, and you can do this, but you see this gentle slope, uh, this gentle 90 here, gentle 90 here, the maximum you can go down is three feet, and again, right where you have a little trap here, you have to put a condensate, a little condensate drain right there. This one is obviously no, because you have a kink in the tubing, all right, nothing's gonna get through there. It's like having a ductwork that's blocked with a piece of insulation. Yep. If you have a sag there, that's a prime place for um, moisture buildup, moisture build condensate buildup. Uh, you need to slope it, otherwise that steam is going to cool off and it's going to start draining back to the unit. And this one obviously is a no because you don't have any trap, or, I'm sorry, a drain right there. Now this is a picture we took from a job site, and I'm just going to kind of let this sit there a second and I want you to think about what you see wrong here. Yeah, you're seeing a lot of elbows, okay? There's an elbow there, there's an elbow up here. This must have four 90 degree elbows before it just gets out of the room where the steam generator is located. And that's 40 equivalent feet. And at this particular job site, that PVC ran a good 60 feet before it went to some rubber steam hose. Um, and you can see this one right here. You can see this 90 degree right out of the, the lower humidifier bank there. Um, Doug looked at that and he goes, well, that's creating a lot of back pressure, right, Doug? What did the facilities manager say to you? So I, I asked him, I said, you know what, I'm surprised that you're not actually blowing out canisters. And he kind of got a smirk on his face and looked at Dave, and Dave says, what? And the guy goes, that explains it. We have been blowing out canisters. Yeah, we've been changing them about every three months. So this is not a good application. This is too many 90-degree elbows here. Uh, and uh, the steam can't flow to where it needs to and be. And the reason we were called to this job site is because they were not meeting set point. Right. And another issue was they were having moisture. But we'll, we'll show you another picture. Another issue. In just, we'll show you another picture in just a second. This one was a job that Doug was out on, and there's a there's a steam generator right there. You can see the canister. You can see the steam line right there. It goes way up above out of the picture. So and basically, went down. a good ten feet. 15 feet into the ceiling. Uh, where it started to loop at the top of the ceiling, it actually went past the supply duct where they could have went right into with a distributor uh, tube or a, a manifold. Instead, they went all the way down where you see that blue tube to the left, uh, and then they went down to an inch off the floor and 90 degree elbowed into a short absorption manifold right behind a cooling coil. So when we did turn the humidifier on, uh, basically all you did is heard running water coming out of the condensate uh, hole down at the bottom at the elbow. Okay, Ryan, I think we're ready for quiz number three. All right, quiz question number three. What is the maximum length of hose you can use for a steam system? A, 20 feet, B, 20 equivalent feet, C, 10 feet, D, 10 equivalent feet. All right, and we'll read off a question while you guys are all answering that. Uh, so Syed asks, is the condensate drain cold enough to drain it directly to the floor drain, or does it need to be cooled first? So generally what you want to do is drain the condensate back to the humidifier. So in, in most manufacturers, in, in their 
uh, user manual, they'll show it going back to the humidifier and then into a reservoir, and then it gets um, cooled with the built-in uh, condensate cooler, and then when it goes into flush and fill, will be cool by the time it reaches the drain. If you have a cast iron drain instead of PVC, you could go directly to the drain. But or from, from the distributor to a condensate cooler uh, with a reservoir and then to the drain as well. Uh, but a lot of it depends on the code for the local the municipality there as far as what temperature has to go into their drainage system. Ninety percent of it depends on the code. On ninety percent. So you may have to mix it to bring it down below the code because normally after it condenses it's maybe around 200 degrees so you might have to mix it. And the National Plumbing Code says at any time you are flushing boiling water into a PVC drain you need to neutralize it to 140 degrees and most humidifier companies now uh, equip their systems with a built-in drain tempering device and all of them have an external one. All right, thank you, gentlemen. So we're going to close the uh, quiz question here in three, two, one. Uh, and it's like 71% of the people said 20 equivalent feet. Right. And I kind of created the question. I kind of emphasized hose there because you could go longer if you're using two-inch copper pipe, insulated copper pipe. Correct. All right, Doug, tell us a little bit about the placement of the distributor tubes in the ductwork and we'll talk about some things that we've seen that uh, are no problem so, so it's hard to, to see in the picture the actual um, inches between uh, each of the distributor tubes but you, spacing in between the distributor tubes is extremely important so that you are not blowing the steam directly onto the uh, Dr. Air Handler itself. Uh, because when you start getting moisture fill forming, that's when you start getting condensate, and that's when you start having moisture uh, or, uh, issues inside the duct itself. So in, in the top two rows, we're basically showing the airflow uh, from left to right and, and showing the spacing and staging either directly on top of each other or, as you can see, offsetting them a, a, a few inches apart. Uh, left to right as well as on top of each other to even out the steam distribution. The other thing that you don't want to do is you do not want to put it into a round duct or an insulated duct uh, where you have moisture collecting on the insulation itself. In, our, in the case of a round duct, the round duct, uh, the edges of the duct, um, some of them are extremely close to the uh, manifold holes or the distributor wound holes and can cause uh, moisture collection there as well. From there, uh, the bottom row shows the uh, uh, vertical distribution uh, and the equivalent spacing needed there as well. Yeah, Doug's referring to these little uh, formulas down here, like one half of the height. You can see some of these things, one fifth of the height. So each each manufacturer has their own uh, dimensions that you have to be careful of. But however, uh, a lot of times when you're designing the system, you merely need to contact the uh, manufacturer you're working with and they will make sure you get the user manual with the appropriate sizing tools. Correct. And spacing tools. All right. Not only is the <clears throat> where you put it in the ductwork critical, also what's uh, upstream and downstream of the ductwork is very critical too. So in this picture, we've got an elbow in place. Uh, it's extremely important that you're far enough away from the elbow uh, with the distributor wand or the manifold, uh, because if you put it too close to it, you're getting the turbulence from the air coming off of that elbow, which again can cause the moisture to build up on the wall of the duct or the air handler. Uh, generally, you want to be at least 24 inches away from that elbow and uh, off to the right, you see a, a, a duct or an air channel a takeoff off to the side. You want to be 24 inches away from that as well to give the uh, humidity uh, uh, adequate time to absorb into the space. Also, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate temperature as well. Um, in most steam applications, or 
you, you should try to be at least 55 degrees or warmer for appropriate absorption into the uh, airstream. David and I were at a job site about five years ago where we first met. Uh, and the reason we were called to the site is they were not getting the appropriate, uh, or they weren't meeting set point, and in a, the ceiling tile was, was leaking. In a data center. In a data center. So when we got to the job site, they had a, a plenum ceiling, and they had the ceiling tile open in a hallway just before it went into the, the data room. Uh, they had a access panel by the distributor wand. We were able to open the panel, uh, view the distributor wand while the system was providing humidity. Basically, what was happening was the wand itself had the nozzles all pointed upwards, and water was literally spinning out of the uh, distributor tube. From there, uh, it was directly off an elbow, uh, and, and I mean, where you, where you see the uh, hanger straps to the left, that's where our wand was. So it was also uh, building up water on the wall as it was spitting. We had both a facility manager and a contractor there. Uh, when we started talking, we tried to first thing identify what the temperature was. And what we were told immediately was, oh, we're at about 54 degrees. Well, 54 degrees, there'd have been some moisture, but not the spinning that we saw. Uh, one of the first things we did was the condensate drain coming off of it. We took a garbage pail and put it up uh, right below it, removed the condensate line, and water just poured out of it. So temperature was the first thing that came to mind. When we first asked them, again, they told us, you know, 53, 54 degrees. Uh, we looked over and the facility manager actually had the system tied to building management system. So we looked over and asked him, what are you reading right now? And he kind of looked over for confirmation from the other gentleman there and then he said, 38 degrees. Well, at 38 degrees, you're, you're going to get more condensate than you are steam production. So they had two issues, temperature and uh, coming off the elbow. Right. You got to even out that velocity profile. That's what you have to do to uh, to have the steam dispersed equally. Yep. So our recommendation, obviously, at this particular time, was to increase the temperature to at least 55 degrees and find a longer stretch away from the elbow to uh, put the distributor tube. All right. I want you to remember back to that one job that uh, a few slides ago that we showed you that had the all the 90 degree elbows. Well, this was the the, the ductwork that it was in. And this is a, a um, roof-mounted air handler. And here you can see the heating coil. And this is the way the air came in. And here was a ductwork that was going straight down. So the, so the first thing is there should have been a short absorption manifold there rather than the distributor tubes. And then, of course, the second is that um, if you look to the left screen, that's where all the plastic uh, tubing you saw went into here, and there's an additional 20 feet of rubber steam hose. So the little bit of steam they were getting to the distributor tubes was condensating out, and from there going onto the wall, but only a fraction of the steam was making it to the uh, distributor tube's face. All right, service area. Don't usually see this, but all the manuals have a service area. You can see this is a, the electrode model, but usually the uh, resistive model or the gas model is the same uh, type of arrangement. This one is 28 inches, so you have to have 28 inches to pull out the steam canisters. Uh, this one had some things in front of it, so it would be very difficult to, uh, to service. So that's one of the things that you kind of think of last, but uh, that's one of the things that the facilities people are going to going to regret that you didn't leave enough room. Correct. Uh, proper controls. I'm going to switch back to the program here a second. Proper controls. You can have all sorts of humidity sensors, duct or room modulating or off and on. Most of the time we see modulating, um, high humidity, uh, high uh, limit sensor modulating. Uh, for Corel, the standard is Modbus, but you can have all different type of back net or lawn controls. And then if you want a remote display, yes or no. A lot of times if this is up in a ceiling or in an area that they can't get to very readily, you might want a uh, remote display. Correct. Uh, these are just different controls that all manufacturers make from uh, a wall 
humidity set points to uh, duct humidity set points, air pressure controllers, you know, air, excuse me, air proving switches, things like that. So you have to specify those too, but most manufacturers have those right in their program. Uh, a little bit about the controls though, because once in a while we get these questions. Uh, if you have the re, uh, a duct uh, humidity sensor instead of a wall humidity sensor, you want to place it before any mixing takes, takes place here, so it's uh, actually reading the true uh, humidity from the room. Uh, the airflow uh, proving switch must be positioned accurately. You can see that right here, right past the uh, outlet of the fan to uh, make sure that the uh, fan is on before you turn on the humidifier. And the high limit switch must be far enough downstream to prevent it from getting wet. So uh, that's down here, getting it wet from the distributor pipe. So you want to put this at least, that says six feet right there. That's usually, six feet is, is a pretty good safe distance, even for uh, colder air, it's going to be absorbed by six feet. All right. Okay, a couple questions here. The gas model, uh, the, the gas model, uh, it's just like a 90% efficient furnace. You have combustion air, PVC, you have uh, exhaust air, vent air, PVC, and this is, can't be any longer than 120 equivalent feet. So if you're using a gas model, watch out that your um, combustion and vent piping aren't too long, otherwise you're going to uh, have problems. Correct. Uh, drain tempering, you want to take this one, Doug? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, drain tempering, somebody asked about drain tempering. Uh, somebody asked about drain tempering. You can see that you should put a funnel here. So if you have to remove the humidifier, you can do that. Um, okay, Ryan, I think it's time for quiz number four. All right, quiz question number four. Is it okay to put the humidifier sensor in the mixed airstream? Yes or no? All right, we do have several questions. We'll try to squeeze a couple in. Um, Dan asks, do you recommend welded, welded stainless steel duct construction for a certain length? where your SAMs are installed? Well, um, provided that the load calc was done correctly uh, and that you've allowed yourself enough absorption distance in the duct itself, uh, you generally don't have to be too concerned when using a short absorption manifold uh, with, with moisture. And a lot of that is making sure that you've got the, the uh, correct preheat in, in the space. So if you've got a, a decent temperature in the space, you're not going to have that issue. So uh, as far as worrying about drainage or anything like that, if it's load size correctly and you followed all the points on the site chart, you should be okay. All right, all right. one more here from uh, Bernadette. She asks, please clarify insulated duct, internally lined versus externally insulated. Also, what is the ash rate recommendation of material of the duct up and downstream of the dispersion tubes? Well, ex externally lined duct, externally lined duct really wouldn't make a difference. The internally lined duct is what's critical. Um, can you repeat the question again? Does she? I think something she's asking you if if you can go ahead and use internally lined duct right there at the dispersion point, or if you need to go to externally wrapped duct. Obviously, so the insulation material doesn't get any moisture. Yeah, you, would, you would have to go to externally wrapped. Or, yeah. or you can take that. Every manufacturer, when they, they do the selections, will tell you what the absorption distance is Okay, on their yeah. software program. Now, now the, the other thing is where, where you absolutely have to use internally aligned duct, what you would do is inside the chamber from the either the manifold or the distributor tube, you would have your normal absorption distance allotment. You would need all that uh, internal, in, internal insulation removed and you would now need to allow yourself at least another 36 inches past that so that you do not get any moisture on the insulated uh, ductwork that's there. Um, the other question I think you said, what is the ash rate recommendation for the type of material used for the duct? Uh, generally, uh, your nor normal uh, uh, aluminum or stainless steel is fine. When you're using adiabatic, 
humidification and you're putting the mist into the air handler and you're using either RO or DI water, you need to make sure from the manifold to either a mist eliminator or if it's being collected on a stainless steel coil that all that duct in between is stainless steel or plastic lined so that no moisture is hitting an aluminum duct. So make sure that you've got enough distance downstream no matter what type of insulation that you use, whether it's mineral wool or, or what. And then just if I can clarify for my own purposes, if you use closed cell foam or if you had a double wall insulated air handler, then I'm assuming this issue goes away because that material is theoretically never getting wet and this closed cell foam can be totally saturated and it's not a problem. So only if it's, no, right. it's, only, if it's only if you're using like fiberglass insulation is there going to be any Correct. concerns. All right, one more clarification and then we're going to move on here. Because numerous people have asked this in relation to quiz question number three, several people said if I'm using a hose, there's not going to be any elbows. So aren't answer A and B both correct? 20 feet and 20 equivalent feet? I'm inclined to think that they're probably right. So that's why I figured I would ask it. I would agree. All right. So well, yeah, well I would I would just say if you're using a hose, you know, it can't be kinked like a, a like a, a strong 90, but sometimes you use a 90 degrees that has a like a radius. You want to use gradual bends because it yeah, is like a short radius to steam. It. Okay. So, but it is always twenty equivalent feet. All right. So what we'll do on that one is when I give them the answer key to the to the PDH folks, I will give them both A and B as a correct answer, since some of you guys probably read it that way. And in this particular case, it's basically the same. All right. Okay. So we'll close this poll here. We have numerous time to answer that one. So hopefully everybody did. Um, and the correct answer is no. Seventy-nine percent people got that one correct. And Brian, I think we had one more. One more. We do have one more quiz question. We'll launch that right here, and then we'll see if we have any final questions for Dave and Doug here. Uh, is it okay to use softened water in a humidifier? Yes or no are your choices. All right, why don't you ask, why don't you finish the quick question? All right, let's go ahead and close this question here. Um, so is it okay to use softened water in a humidifier? Yes or no? Uh, closing that in three, two, one. And uh, looks like 84% of the people said the answer is no, which was the correct answer. That's correct. That's correct. All right. Uh, I want to go back real quick for you guys to uh, quiz question number one, and Dave's going to throw a drawing up on the screen too. Um, when I asked the question, I had jumped in and helped them answer it, and I did not answer it correctly, so it's my fault. Um, when when uh, you guys were when uh, John was asking about if I needed to have an RPZ or an air gap or anything like that, um, and I had answered that. Uh, this is actually not a closed system like a hydronic system. So you do have you do not have any backflow prevention requirements from your typical municipal code here. Uh, this is like having a sink or a shower or any other once pass through type scenario. So you do not need an RPZ, you do not need check valves, you do not need an air gap, you do not need any backflow protect protection devices. 
Um, you're just going right from the city water supply right to the device because the water is a once pass through scenario. It's not being stored or buffered or contained for long periods of time in there. I just recommended to have a, 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 mic, a five micron filter in there. They're showing a P trap. Though. Yeah, well, they're showing a P trap, but. Okay, thank you for your time. Um, if you need any more help, uh, your TEC salesman is always the first contact, or you can contact me. And if I can't answer it, I'll bring Doug Carell in uh, with us. Uh, but uh, you have a lot of people here to support you. So uh, we hope to be seeing you in the future. All right, thank All right. you, gentlemen. Um, and you guys will have access to a future recording uh, in about an hour or two.